شرور أنفسنا وسيئات أعمالنا ما يهده الله فلا مضل له وما يضلل فلا هادي له وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله يا أيها الذين آمنوا اتقوا الله حق تقاته ولا تموتن إلا وأنتم مسلمون يا أيها الناس اتقوا ربكم الذي خلقكم من نفس واحدة وخلق منها زوجها وبث منهما رجالا كثيرا ونساء واتقوا الله الذي تساءلون به والأرحام إن الله كان عليكم رقيبا يا أيها الذين آمنوا اتقوا الله وقولوا قولا سديدا يصلح لكم أعمالكم ويغفر لكم ذنوبكم ومن يطع الله ورسوله فقد فاز فوز العظيم أما بعد فإن أصدق الحديث كتاب الله وخير الهدى, وخير الهدى هدى محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم وشر الأمور محتثاتها وكل محتثة بدعة وكل بدعة ضلالة وكل ضلالة في النار As we continue Kitab al-Tawheed 6.41pm Wednesday December 5th 2018 after the uh, 2018 in the Gregorian calendar which coincides with Rabi'an al-Awwal as we are in the Islamic calendar with the month of Rabi'an al-Awwal the 27th night, which agrees with the year on the Hijri calendar, which was the after the migration of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, 1440. So we continue Kitab al-Tawheed, and we were explaining the different types of guidance. And you'll find that the great Imam, that he put this chapter in, in regards to al-Hidayah, al-Hidayah, and the different types of it. And Hidayah means guidance. <coughs> and we talked about the different types of guidance. We talked about the first level is the general guidance, the general guidance which is shared amongst all the creation, which is not the guidance of faith or the guidance of what is correct. Because we talked about guidance of what everyone, of what which rectifies its, its daily affairs, or what's pertaining to what will what be in regards to allow it to live and carry out its daily, its daily affairs, so it can continue to exist and, al and also to carry out its matters of which will cause its living to be easy and facilitated, such as we talked about, for example, in regards to the, the baby who is naturally inclined as a guidance and his natural disposition knows how to feed or suckle from its mother automatically without, an, uh, without anyone teaching it anything automatically, instinctively knows how to suckle from the mother during that weaning period. And that is something of a natural type of guidance, as we discuss, in which Allah Ta'ala has instilled inside the creation. All those different types, and Yama Ishal Ikhwa is what we discuss, and I don't want to go over it again because I'm a little bit redundant in this regard. We also talked about the second type, which is Hidayat al-Dalala wal bayan the second type of guidance, which is the guidance of what? The guidance of clarification and direction and, clar uh, and clarification and directing and establishing the clear proofs and evidences so one can be guided as far as clarification, but not the guidance of the heart. As we talked about, that type of guidance is what Allah says in his book about his messenger, alayhi salatu wasalam, Verily, you most definitely guide to the correct path. That type of guidance, which category is it, as we discussed? We said it is this one, the second one. Meaning the message of Allah had the ability, was pertaining to the second category, which is hidayah wa, hidayah wa guidance of bayan wa irshad wa tawjih wa dalala. The guidance of direction, clarification, Establishing the proofs, directing, advising, all those matters. The message of Allah وسلم, that he owns and the du'at and the ulama, those from the people who possess knowledge, likewise have this ability. The ability to guide the people as far as clarification. Clarification and direction. We talked about that second category just because one carries it out as they say, لا تستلزم أو لا يستلزم حصول المراد. Just because one has that ability, 
The guidance of the heart does not necessitate that that will take place. Just because one clarifies and one directs and advises does not necessitate that the actual guidance of the heart will take place. But however, <coughs> those from Ahl Ilm and in regards to the Prophet himself, alayhi salatu wasalam, who is the head of all of Ahl Ilm, the Messenger of Allah, alayhi salatu wasalam, despite of everything he was given, of all the signs clearly showing he was a messenger and the Prophet, and during his time there were people who disbelieved. So if that's the case with the Messenger of Allah, then who are we? If the Messenger of Allah who was given everything, the best of character, the best of etiquette, the best of physical, uh, physical, uh, physical appearance, given the signs that was, that was made as far as at his hands, and even as, as far as his lineage, there was every sign Allah to with the made clear to make to the people that he was clearly a messenger of Allah, that he was a prophet, he was a messenger that was sent from Allah to be with Ta'ala. So many signs from, like we said, even before he was sent as a prophet and as a messenger, he was known as the most truthful, most trustworthy one amongst his people, amongst the whole society. Allah made it that way, so when the revelation came, it would be what? It would be established that this, what he was saying was the truth. The people in his city, the people in society, as all those meet people, who he was amongst, they all knew that he was the most what? Trustworthy and was the most truthful. So when the revelation came, no one would have any reluctancy to, to doubt that he was truly saying what was correct. Everything Allah made as a what? As a sign for the people to accept. And despite of that, they belied him. Some of those people, which is to show what? Just because he died to irshad or bayan, just because the guidance of clarification takes place, does not necessitate that what? The guidance of the third category will not what? Carry out. The third category is what, everyone? Hidayat. At-Tawfiq. The guidance of the heart and the guidance of what? Of success. The guide, which is technically the guidance of the heart. Hidayat al-Qalb. Or Hidayat al-Tawfiq. Or Hidayat al-Tawfiq. Or Hidayat al-Qalb. The guidance of the heart and the guidance of success, all that is in the hands of Allah to be with Ta'ala. So that third category, everyone, as we mentioned, the third category, that is only in the hands of Allah to be with Ta'ala. No one else can what? God the hearts except Allah. Allah to be with Ta'ala has clearly said that in his book, in the ayah, which is in the first evidence that the great Imam, Sheikh Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahab, rahimahullah, that he started the chapter and opened it up by that ayah. If you look in your books, it says clearly what? In the man ahbabt, Allah ish yahdi man yisha, wa huwa a'lamu bil muhtadin. Allah Taala says in his book, it's the first ayah in everyone's book. If you look in it, what does it say? Verily, you do not guide whom you love. However, Allah guides whom He wills, and He is the most knowledgeable of those who are properly guided. That ayah, Ma'ash al ikhwa is pertaining to what category from the three categories we mentioned? Which one? This ayah, which is in your books. Number three, which is the guidance of the heart. So Allah is negating the guidance of the heart from the message of Allah. Not totally negating hidayah from the message of Allah because that message of Allah had in his, his capability, what everyone? The second category, which is the guidance of direction. That was in his ability, alayhi salatu wasalam, but however, what Allah Taala is guiding, excuse me, what is negating here in this ayah is what everyone? The guidance of the guidance of the heart. Like we talked about Yama al Ikhwa, we keep emphasizing this point. The message of Allah was given the best of eloquence, he was given the best of appearance, he was given the best of lineage, he was given the best of character, he was given the best of those who can establish proof and evidence, alayhi salatu wasalam. His, he had the best lineage. Signs that were clear as the sun in the sky. No one could deny he was in the message of Allah. And the signs that he came with and the evidences he came with, the moon splitting, water sprouting out of his hands, things were talking that couldn't talk, rocks were given salams, food was making tasbih, all these things that was clearly evidence and ayat and signs that he was the truly the message of Allah and the greatest of all those, those ajaib or the great the greatest of all those amazing signs with the Qur'an. It's the Qur'an and what it contains of clarification and guidance in which no one can tamper with and no one can change and no one can alter to this day. 
So that which the message of Allah was given, and despite of that, like we said, still there were people who denied he was the message of Allah and belied the message. And that's the case with the message of Allah, then who are we? Who are we to now to think that we are able to guide an individual or with some of us men guide certain s- women that we want them to take shahada? <laughs> Sorry, because she looks so good. And we want her to take shahada. <laughs> but despite of that, the guidance is in the hearts of is in the hands of Allah as far as the guidance of the heart. Ya ma'ashan ikhwa. So Allah Ta'ala is negating that from the message of Allah, which is the guidance of the heart. We said that same category, anytime you see guidance of the heart, that is a refutation against the Qadiriyah, the deviant sect called the Qadiriyah, who believe that Allah Ta'ala has no will over his creation. Rather, the creation themselves have total control, as they say, where Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Ta'ala has no, no control, he has no will over his creation or no dominance which is absolutely incorrect. Allah to be with the Allah, nothing happens in this existence except by his permission and by his will. Nothing of good and evil. He allows it to happen of good, and if he allows harm to happen to certain individuals and people, then it's out of some infinite wisdom that he allowed to happen. Allah to be with the Allah is in control, but the creation still has their will where they can choose between right and wrong. You will find that the Qadariyah, like we said, say that the creation, oh, oh, excuse me, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has no will. And from the Qadr of Allah, tabarik wa ta'ala, is him guiding certain people. As we said that in the ayah last week, on the last class, Allah tabarik wa ta'ala says in Surah Al-A'la, Sabih ismi rabbika al-A'la, alladhi khalaqa fasawa, walladhi qaddara fahada. Qaddara fahada. Why did Allah pair, pair? The divine decree with guidance, because the guidance is from his what? Divine decree. <laughs> because his guidance is from what? The divine decree. Meaning that Allah to be with the Allah had written out for certain people that they be properly guided. So that shows everything is under his what? His will. And he to be with the Allah, whom he wills to guide, he guides or who he chooses to misguide, and he what? Misguides them. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to guide us and keep us guided. For what we say, Ya Ma'ash al Ikhwa, that is a refutation against the deviant sect called the Qadariyah. And like I talked about in last class, you'll find the great Imam Abu Bakr al Ajri, the great Imam, Rahimahullah, Abu Bakr al Ajri, Sahib al Sharia, the tremendous book in Aqeedah entitled Al Sharia, used this as a refutation against them where he said, that the Qadariya believe in Allah la yaqdiru ala an yudilla hadiyan wa la yahdi dalan that Allah they the Qadariya believe that Allah is not able to guide one who's misguided nor is he able to misguide the one who is guided based upon their belief system that's what it necessitates you'll find that we said ya ma'ash al ikhwat this chapter in which we're talking about now refutes that notion and it removes that fallacy and that shubha or that ambiguity, that doubt that Allah to be with the Allah, what? that He subhanahu wa ta'ala is not able to do these affairs such as guide the one who is misguided or misguide the one who is guided. And you'll also find that Hidayah, likewise, is from the Qadr of Allah. And we know that the Qadr of Allah is from the Rububi of Allah. All of it is tied in together. I'll say it again for those who want to write it down, because this is very important. That the guidance is from the Qadr of Allah. The guidance is from the Qadr, the, pre, the, the destiny or the, the divine decree of Allah. And the decri- divine decree of Allah is from his Rububiyyah. It's from the Rububiyyah, the Lordship of Allah. And the Qadr is from the Rububiyyah, the Lordship of Allah. So that is from the exact, precise Rububiyyah of Allah. The Qadr. So if Allah to be with the Allah, as we know, the Prophet alayhi salatu wasalam clearly mentioned like Sarahtullah. The Message of Allah alayhi salatu wasalam clearly mentions this in Khutbat al Hajj that he said uh, that Wain Wain Yahdihillahu Fala Mudillah Wain Yudlil Fala Hadiallah. How many times do we hear this in every khutbah? This is exactly what we're discussing. 
which says, whoever Allah chooses to guide, no one can misguide him. Whoever Allah chooses to misguide, no one can guide him. For that which we say, the hidayah of the third category is from the affairs of what? It's from the affairs in which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala only owns. No one else is able to what? Own that matter. For Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, all of the hearts of the ibad of the slaves are in, or be, excuse me, are between two fingers from the fingers of Rahman. And he switches to whom he wills. For Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, for one person can be from those who are misguided today, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, sabaqa fi ilmihi an yahdiyahu. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that preceded in his pre-divine decree and in his knowledge that someone so will be what? Will be guided after he was misguided. And if that happens, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guides that individual. No one will be able to misguide him if Allah chooses to guide him. And, sim- and similar to that, the opposite. A person can be upon guidance today. And then it proceeded in the knowledge of Allah and in his pre-divine decree and destiny that he would mislead that individual and misguide him. And then once that affair takes place, then Allah to be with the Allah will what? Misguide that individual, especially if, if he does an act or an affair which will necessitate that he will be misguided, Allah will what? Increase him in that misguidance. You'll find the ayah which Allah to be with the Allah says is sort of soft. He says, as he says to be with the Allah, he says, فَلَمَّا زَاغُوا أَزَاغَ اللَّهُ قُلُوبَهُمْ He said, for when they went astray, Allah sent their hearts astray. Meaning that they chose misguidance of something that was incorrect and Allah had what? Turned their hearts away and increased them in that misguidance. Similar to that, likewise, the opposite. A person could do an act which will cause one to be guided and Allah increases him in that what? In that guidance. So a person chooses and Allah to be with the Allah will give him tawfiq if it's good and if that person chooses if he chooses something of evil which will take away that ni'mah or that bounty of Allah and the greatest of all bounties as we discuss everyone is guidance of the heart. Guidance of the heart is the greatest of what? All bounties and blessings. There's no greater bounty than being guided in one's heart, being di- directed in the correct path as far as in his belief system. And being firm and steadfast upon that is the greatest of all guidance and the greatest of all ni'am, the greatest of all blessings and bounties. And one should always try to have diligence in protecting that ni'mah from going away, which is from what? Doing everything and fulfilling all the duties that Allah has obliged upon him and carrying out those obligatory acts and even doing something voluntary. So it could be a means for protecting yet that great ni'mah that Allah, rather it's the greatest ni'mah that Allah will give the slave or give the servant, which is guidance of the heart. Because there's a lot of people out there that we see every day who's deprived of proper guidance on a daily basis. Not only deprived of, daily of, of guidance, but even misguided as far as in a lot of their affairs. But having the ultimate creed or, or sound belief system is only something that Allah Ta'ala gives to few people. And that is the greatest of all ni'am. And if Allah wills, he can also snatch it. He can take away that blessing. If one does an act which will necessitate that it be removed. May Allah to be with the Allah keeps us, keep us firm and may he keep us far away from those reasons that will take and remove his ni'am of his blessing. So the third category, Ya Ma'ash al is in this regard that Allah to be with the Allah is the only one that can guide the hearts, no one else. As we know clearly, the message of Allah says so many, uh, so many ahadith about the heart being what? Between the, fi- the two fingers of the fingers of Rahman and he switches it how he wills. One day a person can be what? Could be a mu'min today and be a kafir tomorrow. And a person could be a kafir today and be a mu'min tomorrow. As we clearly know the ahadith that establishes that matter, where Isa alayhi salatu salam, which is mukharraju fi sahihi muslim, where the message of Allah alayhi salatu salam said, he said, Badiru ila al-a'mali fitanan ka qita alayhi al-mudlim, yusbihu al-raju fihi mu'minan wa yumsi kafiran, wa yumsi mu'minan wa yusbihu kafiran, yabi'u dinahu bi'arda min al-dunya. He said, alayhi salatu wasalam, he said, hasten towards righteous actions. He says, qiqita alayl al-mudlim. Hasten towards doing righteous actions. Making meaning, making it a reason towards keeping your hidayah, keeping your guidance, keeping it intact. Hasten towards doing righteous actions. 
Because the righteous actions is what sh- gives the mirror is the mirror of what is in your heart. A lot of people don't know that. A lot of people that actions are what you display and what you manifest mirrors what's in, what's in your heart. The actions confirm what you believe and what is truly in your heart. Do not be tr- fooled by those who say I don't have to do anything. Iman is here. Well, I don't have to do. I don't have to come to Juma. Faith is here, Yahi. I don't have to grow my beard. Faith is here. I don't have to pray five times a day. Faith is here. I don't have to come to Juma every day. Faith is here. Yeah, no, Yahi. Your actions is a confirmation of what's in your heart. That's the confirmation. That's the reason why Allah with the Allah is going to judge both. And you always say that to these people who say that faith is here. And they don't have to do anything. Anything. Say to them, what is Allah going to do on the day of resurrection with the people? What is He going to do? He's going to look at what your heart and what your actions. So that's the reason why we said that one, as it, the Imam Hassan Basri said in a tremendous statement where he said, he says, 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 you know, and, and I will Sunday, one day I'll do this. One day I'll get myself together. One day I'll do what I'm supposed to do. One day hoping and having wishes for something. Or one day get yourself together. He said, however, Iman is what settles in the heart and the actions confirm it. He said, well, I can waqara fil qalb wa sadaqahu al-a'ma. He said, what settles in the heart and the actions confirm it. Is it clear what I'm saying, everyone? Five. So that's the third category. The fourth category, which is the last one, I think everybody's been waiting for this for the past couple of lessons, which is the last category of al hidayah as Ibn al-Qayyim mentions, the level, which is the guidance, one being guided, to paradise or guided to the hellfire. You'll find that they call Maratab al Hidayah ila Jannah wa Nar. The fourth type of guidance on the day of resurrection, Allah Tabri with the Allah will guide certain people and be pointed and directed to the hellfire. And there will be certain people that will be pointed and directed to Jannah, Nasallaha, and Yajah Allah na wa yakuminhum. We ask Allah to make you and make us and you from the people of paradise. He said on the day of resurrection that the, the fourth type of guidance is the guidance. Al-Hidayah imma ila al-Jannah wa al-Hidayah imma ila al-Jannah o ila al-Nar. The God is to either paradise or the God is to what? The hellfire. As we know, Yama Ishul Ikhwa, as the guidance on the day of resurrection being guided to paradise, meaning of what one will, be, will remain firm upon as far as the bridge over hell. Until once he crosses the bridge over hell, You'll find that the fourth type of guidance to paradise, meaning over the bridge that will lead to it. I mean, as we know, there will be a bridge that will be laid over hell. That bridge, if one crosses it, then inevitably he will be able to enter paradise. So either he will fall off of it, we ask Allah to not test us from falling off the bridge because everyone will have to what? Cross over the bridge over hell on the day of resurrection. Everyone. Allah Tabiri wa Ta'ala has said that clearly in his book, in Surah Tamaryam, where he said in his book, وَإِن مِنْكُمْ إِلَّا وَارِدُهَا كَانَ عَلَىٰ رَبِّكَ حَتْمًا مَقْضِيَ That Allah Tabiri wa Ta'ala says in Surah Tamaryam, but he says, he says, there's not anyone from amongst you except that he's going to cross it. Verily, there is an affair upon your Lord that has to be carried out. This is what in illa wa riduha kana ala rabbika hatman maqdiya. That is something that upon your Lord, that's something with your Lord, excuse me, that will have to be what? Carried out. You know, everyone is going to what? Cross over the bridge over hell. And after they cross it, if, if Allah gives the proper guidance, meaning keeping him firm upon it and allowing him to stay firm and not fall off of it, then he will be guided towards what? To paradise. 
And we know the meaning of that is, which is what everyone, whoever Allah keeps firm upon, the proper what everyone, guidance in this world or the proper bridge in this world, Allah will keep him firm upon the bridge over the hellfire and the hereafter. What does he mean? As Ibn Qayyim says, whoever Allah keeps firm upon the bridge in this world, Allah will keep him firm upon the bridge over hell on the day of resurrection. What is Ibn Qayyim talking about? He's talking about this, this whole what we're discussing now. The type of br the bridge over here, oh, excuse me, the bridge in, in the dunya is al-hidayat al ma'nu al-sirat al-ma'nuwi. The, the intangible type of bridge, which is the proper guidance, which is the knowledge, and working in accordance with that. So the sirat al-ma'nawi, meaning that intangible type of bridge, which is the hidayah, which is the guidance. Whoever Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives the proper guidance to, keeps him firm upon that knowledge, and upon that guidance, in this world, and he keeps him firm upon that bridge without slipping or by embarking upon the bunayat al tariq or the little side pathways that will take a person into destruction, not being firm upon the straight path, but on the side paths, that which is called bunayat al tariq those baby paths or those side paths. If Allah keeps you firm upon that straight path in this world, meaning the proper guidance of the proper knowledge, the proper belief, and working in accordance with it. If Allah gives you success to stay firm upon that, then he will what? Keep you firm upon the bridge over the hell, over the hellfire and the hereafter. Meaning that bridge that everyone will see and it will be tangible and everybody will be able to what? See it, touch it, and they will feel it and they will have to cross it. And we know that there's certain characteristics which comes to Sahih Muslim talking about how the bridge in certain narrations some of them said that it's dah, is that he says that it says dahdu mazalla that they say that is what they said it's a place that is it's going to be slippery one narration says the bridge over hell is going to be slippery one narration it says ahaddu min safe that it's going to be sharper than a sword one narration says assalamu alaykum wa yakum wa ahaddu min safe there's a place where people will be slipping and in another narration it says that they will uh, it will be sharper than a sword so in order for one to get over the hellfire, they will have to be what? It will have to be given tawfiq, success from Allah. And it will have to ba be based upon how fast they will get over the bridge over hell as how fast they answered the call of what's correct in this world, of learning proper knowledge and being properly guided, of having faith, meaning the iman of salafiyya. Of, of Salafiyya, because Salafiyya is Islam, and Islam is Salafiyya. That Allah gives tawfiq for that individual to be firm upon that, and learning that ilm, and working in accordance with it, and doing righteous actions. If Allah keeps you firm upon that path, Allah will keep you firm upon the path where you will need, definitely, the tawfiq of Allah to get, every, get you across, which is in the hereafter. So that type of hidayah, ya ma'ash al-ikhwah, that is, you'll find, is the meaning of what we're discussing. Meaning, عَلَىٰ قَدَرِ ثُبُوتِ قَدَمِ الْعَبْدِ وَسَيْدِهِ عَلَىٰ هَذَا الصِّرَاطِ He said, based upon how he remained firm and steadfast in this world will be the how and the amount of how he will be firm where his feet will be planted firm over the bridge where he'll be able to cross it and that bridge that everyone will see. And that which Allah Taala will raise for all of his ibad, or for his, not all of his ibad, but some of his ibad, in order for them, if they was to cross it, then they will attain the ultimate reward, which is paradise or everlasting bliss. May Allah make us, uh, make us in you from them. You'll find that, th what is the delay for this fourth category, everyone? Allah says in his book, As Allah says, As Allah Ayat number 22 and 23. Allah Taala says in his book, gather those who fell into oppression. With the meaning of dhulm here in this context, meaning those who fell into polytheism. <laughs> you fell into disbelief and polytheism. And those who were not there only as wives. A lot of people think it means wives here. The tafsir doesn't mean, it doesn't say that. Meaning those who are from 
their group or their companions. They all were upon the same thing. Gather all of them together and what they used to worship besides Allah, guide them to the hellfire. Guide them to the hellfire. Notice the point of reference here is what? It said hidayah, the word hidayah, meaning guidance. So Allah said, guide them to the hellfire. Meaning that they were not firm upon what was correct in this world. And as a result of it, they became what? Misguided to the point they were guided to something that they detest would be the ultimate humili humiliation in the hereafter. Which is to be guided to the hellfire. <laughs> also those you'll find Allah Tabari with the Ella says in the opposite, which is a surah to Muhammad, ayat number four and six, or four two six. Well, Allah Tabari with the Ella says in his book, وَالَّذِينَ قُتِلُوا فِي سَبِيلِ اللَّهِ فَلَنْ يُضِلَّ أَعْمَالَهُمْ سَيَهْدِيهَمْ وَيُصْلِحُ بَالَهُمْ وَيُدْخِلُهُمُ الْجَنَّةَ عَرَّفَهَا لَهُمْ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says to Surah Muhammad, he says those who were killed in the cause of Allah, Allah will not render their actions misguided, meaning fruitless. He says we will guide them and we will rectify their matter or their affairs. And we will enter them into paradise. So Allah is still talking about a type of hidayah, of guidance. We will enter them in their paradise and we will make it known and clear to them. So this is the fourth category. Just to sum it up, make it concise, everyone. The guidance of being either guided to the hellfire or guided to what? To paradise in the hereafter. <laughs> is it clear what I'm saying, everyone? Allah says, Ayat number four to six. Four to six. Those who are killed in the cause of Allah, that we will not lead or render their actions null and void, we will misguide their actions. Meaning that we will not render them fruitless. They will benefit the day of resurrection from their actions. Notice Allah says, Ayat number four talks about actions in the Quran. How in the hereafter, actions, actions, actions. So, how can anyone be Muslim and say, I don't have to pray, the man is here? All these, everything, I've, everyone's survival on the day of resurrection is going gonna, is gonna to rely on two affairs, mainly. Which is your faith, your iman, and your righteous action. <laughs> everything of every obstacle on the day of resurrection relies on those two affairs. Everything. How fast you get a bit across the hellfire based upon your iman and how firm you were in this world and the righteous actions you did. Whether or not you receive your recompense, meaning your book. Your book is going to be filled with what? Your actions. You'll be, when it's given to, if, to you, either in your right hand or your left hand, what is going to be in it? Except the law is going to hold you accountable for your what? For your actions. For everything as far as your life, in regards to the wudu, as the Prophet Sallallahu talked about. He says, which will be given to the mu'minin the day of resurrection. Because some people will, have, will be bright in their light and their, radi their radi radiance. of Their light will be what? Strong. And some of them will be dim, and some people will be totally black. All of that is based upon what? Your, your righteous actions. How much you used to make wudu? Well, we know wudu is a what? Is an action. All those things are what? Actions. There's no getting around your actions. So how can person th look at all these ahadith in which Allah mentioned in his book and in the authentic sunnah up to let one know how vital one's actions are? <laughs> that you have to act. There's no way you can be Muslim and not do anything and, just, and say ultimately faith is here. That is absolutely what? Baseless. And the kitab and the sunnah refutes that. There's no way you can survive in this world and in the hereafter except that you have to what? To act. Even in affairs of your worldly matters. If you wanted to be a millionaire, is there any way that this is unacceptable, for example, for a person now to sit on his behind and not do anything except that he has to what? Put some type of effort into doing it? You'll find that there's nothing of people who have accomplished except very few people. But those who truly benefit and those who are truly grateful are people that actually worked hard for where they what? had to get where they had to get to. No matter whether it's in your worldly affairs or your religion, you have to do some type of what? Some type of work. How did you become the most knowledgeable person except that he what? I had to study. Knowledge didn't just come out of the sky and fill into my brain. I had to put forth an effort. Right? I'm not talking about myself. I'm talking generally. You understand, everyone? So I had to do a type of action. How did you become, uh, for example, how did you attain or being fast for the month of Ramadan or how did you? Become close or reaching high levels and degrees with Allah, except that you have to what? Do some type of actions. 
You have to want fast. You have to pray. All these are what, everyone? Actions. All these affairs, there's no getting around actions. There's no getting around it. It's unacceptable even in worldly affairs. How much more than affairs that will, that's supposed to rectify your soul? So what we say, Ya Ma'ash al these are the four, four categories of hidayah. Before we actually now, we'll have some type of foundation. Well, based upon that, you'll find how everything will fall to its place through these texts. You'll be able to pick out which one manifests itself when we start to read these hadith. Fine. So everyone, if you look in your book, It comes to Sahih Muslim upon Ibn al Musayyib. Ibn al Musayyib. Ibn al Musayyib. It says in your books, it says, Who is Sa'id ibn al Musayyib? Oh, let me just read the text first. But for Sahih, Ibn al Musayyib, and Abi, Kala Lama Hadrat Aba Talib al Wafa, Jahu Rasulullah Sallam, or Indahu Abdullah ibn Abi Umayyah, or Abu Jahlin, for Kala Lahu Ya Ami. قُلْ لَا إِلَهَ إِلَّا اللَّهِ كَلِمَةً أُحَاجُّ لَكَ بِهَا عِنْدَ اللَّهِ فَقَالَ لَهُ أَتَرْغَبُ عَنْ مِلَّةِ إِبْرَاهِيمِ عفواً عفواً أَتَرْغَبُ عَنْ مِلَّةِ عَبْدِ المطلب فأعاد عليه النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم فأعاد فكان آخر ما قال هو على ملة عبد المطلب وأبى أن يقول لا إله إلا الله فقال, فقال النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم أستغفرن لك ما لم أنهى عنك It says in the first narration, and if everyone looks in your books, on the authority of Ibn al-Musayyib. We're going to explain who Ibn al-Musayyib is on, upon his, his father. He said that when Abu Talib, who's Abu Talib, everyone? It's the uncle of the message of Allah. He says when death, meaning he was about to die. He says that the message of Allah came to him. And he said, before he, oh, excuse me, he had around him what? He had around him two people. Matter of fact, it was three. It was Ibn Musayyib, it was uh, Musayyib, Musayyib himself. Musayyib and Abdullah ibn Abi Umayyah and Abu Jahl. It was three. In the narration, it says two, but was. In actuality, it was three. It was the one who narrated it, it was Musayyib. Musayyib narrated it. And Abdullah ibn Abi Umayyah was there and Abu Jahl. Musayyib became Muslim. Musayyib was a Sahabi. Radiallahu anhu. Abdullah ibn Abi Umayyah also became Muslim. The only one who remained upon kufr was who? Abu Jahl. Abu Jahl. He said, oh, my uncle, he says, say la ilaha illallah, a word that I will argue with you in front of Allah, or with it, in front of Allah on the day of resurrection, of course. He says, do you desire the way of Abdul Muttalib, or Abdul Muttalib, meaning the way of polytheism, of what they used to worship of idols. Do you desire other than that? So the message of Allah repeated what he said, and they were also repeated. Until the last affair in which he died upon is what? He's upon the way of Abdul Muttalib, which is a way of polytheism. He died in that state. May Allah to be with the what? Preserve us. To die in a state which is humiliating as such as that. Fa'aba, so he refused to say La ilaha illallah. So the message of Allah so he said, mentioned and said, I will seek forgiveness for, I will seek forgiveness from Allah for you as long as I'm not prohibited. Until Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed the ayah, which is in Surah at Tawbah, where he said, Ma kana lil Nabi Walladina Amanu and Yastafiru Lil Mushrikina Walo Kanu Uli Kurba Min Batima Tabayana Lahum and Nahum Ashabul Jaheen. It says and revealed in the ayah that it says that it is not for the messenger and those who believe to seek forgiveness for the polytheists. Even if they're the closest of kin or they're the closest of their family. 
after it has been made clear that they are the inhabitants of hell. May Allah Taala preserve us. Five. Number five. So it says at the beginning, number one, as we know, the narration started upon Ibn al Musayyib. Who's Ibn al Musayyib? Ibn al Musayyib is Sa'id ibn al Musayyib. Sa'id ibn al Musayyib. Sa'id ibn al Musayyib. Oh, we can say I'm going to say Sa'id ibn al Musayyib. Ibn Hazan. Ibn Hazan. Musayyib and Hazan were two companions of the Prophet. Musayyib and Hazan. Sa'id was not a comp- was not a Sahabi. I'll say it again. Sa'id ibn Musayyib narrated upon his father, who is who? Musayyib. <laughs> Sa'id ibn Musayyib ibn Hazan. Ibn Hazan. I'm going to just make his lineage short, keep it short. Al Qurashi al Makhzumi. Al Qurashi. Al Makhzumi, Sa'id ibn Musayyab ibn Hazan. He has a long lineage, but I'll keep it short, summarized for today. Sa'id ibn Al Musayyab ibn Hazan, Al Makhzumi, Al Qurashi. Al Makhzumi, Al Qurashi. His father, Musayyab, and his grandfather, Hazan, were two companions. As far as Sa'id, I'm sure that everyone has heard the name Sa'id ibn Musayyab for those who read a lot. Who's, uh, they, I'm sure that a lot of people have heard, especially if you go for Caesar study and you hear the ulama give a lesson, you'll find a lot of narr- narrations upon the great scholar who was from the, the greatest of the scholars of that particular time who was a tabi'i. He was not a sahabi. But his father was a sahabi and his grandfather was a sahabi. His name, his name was Sa'id. You'll find he was considered Ahd al Ulama al Fuqaha al Kibar al Saba min al Tabi'een. He was considered from those who the seven great of those in which knowledge all referred back to during his time. Sa'id ibn Musayyib. He was from the greatest of the scholars of fiqh, meaning in the religion in general, from the Tabi'een, from those who followed the Sahaba, meaning those who what? For the companions, no, not companions, but those who followed the Sahaba. They were called Tabi'een. We know that Sa'id ibn Musayyib was whatever he, everyone, he was a Tabi'i. He was not a Sahabi. He was from the great seven of the Fuqaha as Sab'a, from the seven scholars in which knowledge was referred back to during his time. From the seven of the head, of where he had so many narrations memorized, until you'll find that Al Hadith. I don't want to get into Marasi, I gotta get break inside the terms. But as you'll find that the great Ahl Ilm, from those from the great scholar of our religion, likewise, his name was Ali ibn al Madini. Ali ibn al Madini. Where he has a book called Al Ilal. And he was the greatest of those who had knowledge of hidden weaknesses and chains of narrators and hadith. His name was Ali ibn al Madini. These names you need to be familiar with because they, they are the scholars that protected. This religion from people who tried to what? Corrupt it. Ali ibn al-Madini said about Sa'id ibn Musayyib, he said, I don't know anyone of amongst the tabi'een who is more vast in knowledge than Sa'id ibn Musayyib. I did not know anyone who was more, more most, had, was awsa ilman fi tabi'een than Sa'id ibn Musayyib. I did not know anyone who was more vast in knowledge, vast in knowledge amongst the tabi'een than Sa'id ibn Musayyib. You writing this down in your books? I don't know anyone more vast in knowledge than, I mean, during his time, the Sa'id ibn Musayyib. Like we said, his father was a Sahabi. Who was his father, everyone? Not Ibn. His father was Musayyib. Musayyib was his father. His father, and likewise, The grandfather, Sa'id Musayyib's grandfather, who was Hazan, was also a Sahabi. 
They were comparing it to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Ali ibn al-Madini, Ali ibn al-Madini was a tabi'i. Ali ibn al-Madini, from what I remember, is not a tabi'i. He was from the greatest scholars of, of the past. It was Ali ibn al-Madini. But what comes to my mind, Ali ibn al-Madini was not a tabi'i. Ali ibn al-Madini. Ali ibn al-Madini was from the greatest of Ahl al-Ilm, especially when Imam Ahmed had praised and said that he was the mo- one of the most knowledgeable of those who knew about hidden weaknesses in hadith, in chains, was Ali ibn al-Madini. Ali ibn al-Madini. These are very names that are very important that you, everyone should be familiar with. Ali ibn al-Madini. Ali ibn al-Madini. Ali ibn al-Madini. I have his book. It's called Ilal. But the, I have a book. It's called Hidden Weakness. It's a book called Hidden Weakness. But it's, it's, it's but the rest of it, part of the book has been found, but the rest of it is lost. So it's not all of it. So a part was found, and, a, and some other parts of the book was also was lost. But there is a book by Ali ibn al-Madini and his other ones. It's called Ilal, Hidden Weaknesses in Hadith, by the great Imam Ali ibn al-Madini. Like we said, a portion of it was found, but the rest of it was lost. By Ali, the great Imam Ali ibn al-Madini. But Ali ibn al-Madini praised Sa'id ibn Musayyab, along with others from those from the ulama of that time, I did not know anyone that has more vast knowledge in, amongst the tabi'een than Sa'id ibn Musayyab. Like we said, he was during his time, was from those who knowledge was referred back to in hadith during his time from one of the seven of the fuqaha, of the scholars of jurisprudence, who knowledge was referred back to and he would be asked during his time. was, was Sa'id ibn Musayyab. Type. You'll find that it also mentions, it says, that's Musayyab, that it says, you'll find that even Sheikh Abdul Rahman Hassan Ali Sheikh, in regards to this particular narration, who was the one who explained Kitab al Tawheed and another explanation called Fatih al Majid. Sheikh Abdul Rahman Ali Hassan Ali Sheikh. This is what he goes on to say. He says, it says about this narration, he says, يحتمل أن يكون المسيب حضر مع الاثنين فإنهما من بني مخزوم. He says, it, it was perhaps that it said it is, maybe, pro- or probably, a fact that Musayyab did attend when this happened with the message of Allah. That Musayyib was probably there. He says, why? Because Musayyib and also likewise. Abdullah ibn Abi Umayyah are from the tribe of Makhzum. So they're both Makhzumi. They're from Makhzum. And they say that also all of them were upon kufr at that particular time, if that was the case, if Musayyib was there along with, Abd- along with Abdullah ibn Abi Umayyah, that they both at that time were upon kufr. So they became Muslim, but Abu Jahl was the only one that remained upon kufr. As we know, he died in the state of what? Disbelief. Taib. So the message of Allah alayhi salatu wasalam, the point of reference in the hadith is this. He says, when he was around, he said, my uncle, say la ilaha illallah. A word in which I'll argue for you by that word and with Allah to be with the Allah. Meaning I could use it as a proof which will save you from hell. Meaning a proof that will save you from eternal torment. So if the message of Allah is saying that this is a word, if you firm and believe it firmly, it will be a way in which you'll be saved from eternal what? Torment. From eternal torment and eternal damnation, if you want to say, and also re- abiding in it forever, never being co- brought out of it at all. So he said, say, la ilaha illallah. Meaning, I'm me, you, my uncle, you did the most honorable of noble acts. Why? Because we know Abu Talib, however, didn't defend the Messenger of Allah out of Iman. He only defended the Messenger of Allah, as they say, based upon his qaraba, or hubba lahu, hubba al-qaraba. Out of love for him, which is love of his, what? of his family, 
and also that which is pertaining to Hamiya, Hamiya Jahiliya, of something also likewise. Pertaining to what is just his family or his lineage or what is considered a dutiful honor of protecting one who's in his family. So well, it wasn't out of faith. Rather, it was something, as they say, Hamiyatan or Hubban Lahu, Mahabbat al Qaraba, out of love of, his, of him being in his family, and also likewise some type of what? Blind fanaticism regards. A blind fanaticism in regards to something that's connected with jahiliyyah. Not truly believing in what the Messenger of Allah, being a Messenger of Allah, or loving his personality. As you'll find that it's from the belief of some of the enemies of Islam. You'll find, for example, that some of the mustashriqeen, the orientalists, you'll find that they say, and they, you'll find that they do say this, this is documented, that he was the greatest personality that ever lived on the, on the earth. The greatest personality. And after that, was, and after that was Paul, then Jesus. <laughs> they say the greatest person or the greatest personality that ever lived on this planet of human beings was Muhammad ibn Abdullah alayhi salatu salam. This is the Kufar saying this. Now Muslim saying this. Then they say Paul, then they say Jesus. Why do they say Paul second? Because the majority of the Christians believe in the, do in the, in the doctrine of Paul, not the belief of the true teachers of Jesus, the son of Mary. Because if you'll find that the scholars of, of Christianity, the when they actually study it based upon facts, that the Christians follow the teachings of Paul, not the teachings of Jesus, the son of Mary. All the different types of innovative beliefs, such as him dying on the cross, or him claiming that he's a law or part of a law or third of three, that was all that was introduced by Paul, not by Jesus, the son of Mary. As Jesus, the son of Mary, only called the people to worship a law, not to say that he was part of a law, or that he was a third of three, or that he was a law, or to the end of it. That was something that was introduced by Paul. So that's the reason why they say the most influential, most, persona the in most influential personalities was Muhammad, alayhi salatu wasalam, then who? Then Paul, then Jesus. You'll find that the Orientalists say this about the Messenger of Allah. They say he's the greatest personality, the greatest, most influential personality. They loved him, for example, based upon some type of respect, out of respect, for example, or love out of, for example, uh, of what he did or what he contributed to society. But not having faith, none of these affairs benefit. Not saying or saying that he's not the true message of Allah or, or having love of Iman, then those type of, of mentionings or praise does not benefit the individual. Even though you might acknowledge and confess that he was a what, genius, or that he was the most influential individual or personality that ever lived on earth. He was a genius. He contributed so much. So all the different types of praise that they gave to the message of Allah, but that still is not what? Not beneficial. The same thing what happened with Abu Talib. Abu Talib, the same exact thing. He did not believe in the message of Allah, of, or he did not defend him of what was out of what? Out of faith, that he was truly the message of Allah. And renouncing and denying and rejecting the way of polytheism and coming in the fold of mon monotheism and acknowledging that he truly was the messenger of Allah, alayhi salatu wasalam. Even though he had knowledge that he was truly the messenger of Allah, but he did not confess it with the tongue and he did not what? Embrace it as far as in his mu'taqad, in his creed. Even though in the back of his mind he knew he was the messenger of Allah. Because you find that the poetry that it says about Abu Talib, that he said in his poetry, وَلَقَدَ عِلِمْتُ أَنَّ دِينَ مُحَمَّدٍ مَنْ خَيْرِ أَدِيَانِ الْبَرِيَّةِ دِينَ وَلَوْلَا الْمَلَامَةُ أُمَّ خَافَ مَا سَبَّتٍ لَوْ وَجَدْتَنِي صَرْحًا بِذَلِكَ مُبِينًا Well, another narration, oh, can you? he says in one narration, Abu Talib, he said, Verily, indeed, I know, indeed, I, وَلَقَدْ عِلِمْتُ أَنَّ دِينَ مُحَمَّدٍ مَنْ خَيْرِ أَدِيَانِ الْبَرِيَّةِ دِينَ I most definitely, indeed, I know that the deen of Muhammad is the best of religions or way of life as far as every creature, even as far as the human beings. Listen to what he said, the reason why he, 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 he denied it or he didn't want to embrace it. If it wasn't for the fact of my people insulting me or criticizing me or rejecting me or finding me blameworthy because I rejected the ways of my, what my grandmother or my grandfather or my those who were from my family were upon 
and I don't want to go outside of that because they, that, that might be a reason for them treating me bad now and making mockery of me. Similar to what you'll find of what happens to us in this country. We'll find all our gen generations are upon Christianity, and it's not really a long generation because the majority of people who came from Africa were upon Islam. But I'd rather Christianity was forced upon them. But at any rate, you'll find in regards to what was pertaining to me, some of the grandfathers, oh, I don't want to deviate from that because that's what my grandmother and my grandfather believe, and I'm afraid that they're going to find me or treat me like an outcast, or they will give me some type of, they will start to censor me, or they will treat me in an evil manner based upon this way. So Abu Talib, based upon this type of way of thinking, rejected what was correct. And which came as a result of it, what they say, أَخَذَتْهُ الْحَمِيَّةُ الْجَاهِلِيَّةُ الْحَمِيَّةُ الْجَاهِلِيَّةُ Or that non-pre-Islamic type of enthusiasm that was in his veins overtook him. And what came as a result of it, it made him die in the most evil state that a human being could die upon. So one has to be careful of what? Blind following something just because it was just something that the people of old used to do, even if they were just in your family. For verily, that is not a justification that one remain what? Upon it, if actual facts and evidences have been made clear to the individual. You'll find that none of these affairs make sense. Allah Ta'ala has made it clear that Jesus never died on the cross, rather someone died in his place, and all the other affairs that come. And then still you'll find that they'll say, I know it doesn't make sense, but you just have to believe. It's just like a person saying right now outside, it's the nighttime, and you'll say, no, 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 it's the daytime. And you'll be like, it's clear, it's, it's clear, it's, it's the nighttime. I know it doesn't make sense, you just got to believe it's the daytime. You understand what I'm saying? Now, those does it doesn't make sense, but right now, it's the daytime. Just like, for example, a person would say, some of you come to you and say, two plus two equals four. Two plus two equals four. Based upon the ideologies and principles of the Jews and the Christians, it's just like saying two plus two equals five. No, it isn't two plus two equals four. No, two plus two equals five with them. I know it doesn't make sense. I know it doesn't make sense. I know it doesn't sound right. But you just had to have faith that what? Two plus two equals five. It's <laughs> it doesn't make sense. But you just got to just believe that one day that two plus two will evolve and eventually equal five. And no one in this room would be like, what kind of nonsense is this? You understand, everyone? But it's sad to say that there are still people out there that still believe this. That's the reason why it goes back to what we just discussed, that the hidayah, the proper guidance, is with the heart, and also what took place with Abu Talib is the same thing. So based upon that, what will one conclude or gather from this, everyone? That even though the message of Allah, alayhi salatu wasalam, Abu Talib defended the message of Allah, defended him, and, the, and he also witnessed certain affairs from his etiquette, from his akhlaq, from his lineage, and also from the different types of signs that Allah allowed to happen at the hands of the Messenger of Allah, still, however, the guidance was still what? Rejected. Which to let you know, even though a person could be upon clear guidance, and an individual could be right beside him, seeing everything that he does, and still at the same time be what? Be misguided. And this is exactly what happened with Abu Talib. And he said about that, he said, indeed, I definitely know that what Muhammad Sallallahu was upon is the truth. If I wasn't for the fact they found me blameworthy or they would rebuke me or they would censor me or they would curse me, you would see me openly confessing to it. That's what he said in the poetry about himself. He said, He said, if it wasn't for the fact that they found me blameworthy or they would insult me or mock me, you would see me openly professing to it. So he said clearly to show that he what? had firm surety that the message of Allah was upon guidance, and he was upon the, what was correct. Surety. He said, I know definitely he's upon guidance. You'll find there were certain sahaba that they, even when they seen the message of Allah, as soon as they looked at him, they knew he was the, as a prophet of Allah. As the message of Allah was given the greatest of qualities physically and etiquette-wise, behavior, lineage, Allah made it so clear so everyone, he, when he came, you cannot deny it. You'll find if you look, and that's the reason why you'll find that the ulama talks about going through the books and you'll find the lessons called al-shama'il al-muhammadiyya the characteristics of Muhammad alayhi salatu wasalam because it gives you more surety how he was the message of Allah alayhi salatu wasalam it gives you more surety 
of how he looked like a prophet, showing how his stature was, how he looked. He wasn't too tall. He wasn't too short. He was masculine. He had great etiquette. He had great character. He was an honorable individual. He was very kind. He was very noble. He had bravery. He had all the traits of what was praiseworthy of a human being, all with him in him and which Allah gave him so it could be clear as the sun in the sky that he was the messenger of Allah, alayhi salatu salam. He was the most bravest of the people, in which even Ali ibn Abi Talib said in the narration, he said that, Kunna idha shtadda bin al kunna nattaqi bin Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He said that, that the war that became severe, meaning the battles, the messenger of Allah was in the forefront. And he said that we used to find to seek protection with him when it became real what? Very, very severe. When the battle became intense to the point where it was very, very intense and no one could tolerate it, they said we took refuge, we took protection with the Messenger of Allah. Alayhi salatu salam. So he's given the best of quality. In contrast to those of people of Takfir who say that we should kill the not kill the Muslims, kill the non-Muslims, they're all kufar. Those who call it this, they're in the but they're in the fourth. <laughs> They're in the back of the rank in a, in a room in a, in, a, in a building somewhere inciting the people behind a screen. And they're the last people to be in the forefront leading the battle. <laughs> Those who incite it. Which lets you know they're upon what? Falsehood. The message of Allah, when it was a legislative battle, he was in the forefront. As he participated in more than 20, over 20 battles, he was in the forefront of the Salatu Salam. He was in the forefront of those who what? Of defending. So it shows that he was given all the characteristics of what? Of what was praiseworthy. Alayhi salatu salam, despite of that, Abu Talib still re what? Rejected it. Is it clear to everyone? Right, we'll stop here. Uh, any questions about the lesson? Tafaddal. Tafaddal. Abdul Muttalib, huh? Yeah, that's referring to his, the people, the dean, the religion of his forefather. Mm -hmm. Because they were all family. Mm -hmm. Anything else? Say it again. Saeed Ibn al It's in your book. No, no, it's not in your book. It's not in there. Se matter of fact, no, it's not in there. It is in there? It just says Ibn al Musayyib. His name was Saeed Ibn al Musayyib. Saeed. Yeah, that's his father. But it says Ibn al Musayyib. Son of Musayyib, which was Saeed. The son of Musayyib, who was Saeed. Saeed Ibn al Musayyib. Ibn Hazan with a noon. Not Hazm. Hazan. Hazan. Hazan was a was his grandfather. He was a Sahabi. So was Musayyib. So Musayyib and his father, who was Hazan, was what? They were two companions. Sa'i was a Tabi'i. Sa'i ibn Musayyib was a Tabi'i. Sent. Good question. Which category from the categories we mentioned does this fall under, brothers? Number one, two, or three? Or could it be both? <laughs> so one brother say two, one brother said three, then another brother said it could be both. Is it two, three, or both? Huh? Uh, I did say that. We could say both. We could say both. Why we say that? Because the Prophet Sallallahu guided him, which is the second category. But what did not take place was the third, because the third category he was he was he wasn't guided. But the second took place, which was clarification. That took place. But the third didn't carry out, even though. He, the second was established. So the third category of he died of the, of the heart was not what? Was not carried out. So we'll say that in that way. 
I said the third. That was probably a mistake. That was a mistake upon my life. That was a mistake of mine. That was a mistake. We could say the second took place, but the third did not carry out. That's what, that's correct. But what I said third, I was incorrect. Anything else about the lesson, everyone? Absolutely. Absolutely. You have to. I said, good question. Basically, he said a person can believe in Islam, but a person has to what? Utter it. Was that, is that applicable for here? Not only he did not confess it verbally, he didn't believe, he didn't recognize the message of Allah as far as in him being a prophet, messenger. So it's not only verbally he didn't say it, but also as far as in his, in his belief system wasn't acknowledged. So th when we're saying that he, he knew he was the messenger of Allah, I mean he had knowledge as far as what was the truth, but he did not embrace it. But in the back of mind, he knew what was correct. There's a lot of people like that all the time. You'll find people that know what was correct, but they still want to embrace it. They won't profess to it, either out of arrogance or out of some worldly things that they're afraid that might happen. If, if I embrace this, then something worldly might go away from me. That happened during the time of the message of Allah. There were certain people that knew he was the messenger of Allah, but out of fear that their, their kingdom might go away, they stayed upon Kufa. But ultimately, they still knew what? He was correct. There's different types of things and scenarios and, and, and reasons. But those, and but the reason for Abu Talib was this one. He knew in the back of his mind he was correct, but he didn't embrace him as far as being a prophet where he followed him and, and believed in what he came with, of the truth. Anything else, anyone? It's good for one of the brothers, inshallah, Ezra. I'm glad you came, though, today. Jazakallah khaira. Anything else, everyone? It's like the whole class. I got to... <laughs> I have to break down the whole class again. Ta anyone else? Anything? Nothing? Caden? You understand? طيب هذا وصل الله وسلم مبارك على نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه سبحانك اللهم وبحمدك أشهد أن لا إله إلا أنت استغفرك وأتوب إليك.